Yeah. Yeah, now I'll... it is visible. Fine. Shall shall we start? Yeah, we can start. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed Muhammad Khalil, uh, you all know, and today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, theories and concepts in natural resource economics, uh, which uh, is part of MSD 0 and 4 ecological economics, in which I will be touching upon some key topics of block 2 in unit 1 and 2. So let me start with this uh, quotation by Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, whom you all know, was called the father of the Green Revolution in India. So he says, I quote, if conservation of natural resource goes wrong, nothing else will go right. So, so how important and crucial are natural, natural resources? This is the topic of today's talk, which I'm going to cover. I'm So for this counseling session, uh, I uh, present the following. I will be briefly talking about the background about the natural resources. And I will talk about few key terms which are involved. And then we'll talk about the classification of uh, natural resources and the premises and the economic theory behind it and the important questions about them and uh, taking examples of uh, biological resource, a simple economic model for a biological resource. Uh, I will demonstrate how we can uh, look at the output or production or harvest of the biological resources. And similarly, I will talk about uh, by fish, uh, fisheries by economic model, uh, how we can sustainably harvest uh, fish, then Every model has limitations, so we'll discuss few of the limitations of those bioeconomic models. Then we'll talk about the non-renewable resources and the economic theory backing it up. Then we'll also talk about the limits to economic growth and natural resources, where I will be particularly talking about an important concept called resource curve, resource curves. And then lastly, I will talk about the capital stocks of the economy and its components. Okay, let's start then. So debate on natural resources, uh, particularly talk about the issues of scarcity and growth. Uh, it dates quite back to 17th and 18th century and one of the prom key prominences is Thomas Malthus. Uh, whose uh, theory of uh, population was very popular where he talked about uh, rapid rise in population and what will have uh, demand for resources will increase. So it was very popular. So particularly natural resource economics focuses on supply, demand and allocation of those natural resources. And one of the purpose is that we are trying to better understand the natural resources in the economy and develop methods which are sustainable so that uh, we can save them for a future generation. What is sustainable development all about? And economic theories uh, help us in this to understand rationale of natural resource allocation and how we can solve the natural resource problems. Uh, the environment in which we live, the natural environment, it, it is uh, multifunctional. So it uh, provides raw materials and it also gives us several services, uh, which we call as ecosystem services. And we can classify the natural resources based on physical properties, time scale of relevant adjustment process, which uh, takes in, into account the depreciation value. So with this background, uh, I think we are uh, ready to start the discussion. So here I have put two terms, uh, particularly of relevance when we are talking about natural resources. That is first uh, is a scarcity. So scarcity is some, we can say that's a declining availability of natural resources such as fresh water or soil. And this is scarcity, as I was talking about what uh, Thomas Malthus says, that the population will right rapidly, we will get short of natural resources, or natural resources will get exhausted. So this is what uh, scarcity 
talks about and uh, there can be several ways uh, by which uh, scarcity comes into picture uh, it may be driven by say demand it may be driven by supply and it may be because of structural changes in the economy so for example if i talk about demand induced scarcity so if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, the population grew more than four times between 1950 to 2000. So there was a lot of pressure on the resources because of this rapid rise. And if you look at the supply side, so I have put up an example of uh, Kingai Tibetan Plateau. So over the last two, three decades, uh, almost 900 square miles area of the plateau because of overgrazing by cattle has turned into desert and so which has become a big problem for the residents and the government in this area. Then a structural scarcity I provided example from South Africa and uh, we know that uh, South Africa has been suffering from system of apartheid for a long time so because of the unequal access to natural resources there's a lot of unequal access to natural resources and uh, you can understand because the 87% land uh, is owned by the whites and uh, the rest of the black population, so the they are majority is having only 13%. So you can understand how much pressure will be on the resource use and environmental degradation. Next uh, uh, term is uh, maximum sustainable yield. So it, particularly talks about maintaining the population size, which is consistent with the maximum level of sustainable harvest. For example, in case of fisheries, if there is a pond, uh, say, which is open to public, there are limited amount of fishes. So if we keep on uh, fishing and we don't restrict the level of fishing, so one day the fishes will run out. So this uh, concept talks about what should be the level of harvest so that we are able to sustain the harvest for future. Of course, it considers biophysical factors which affect natural growth of the fishes in this example, for example. Now here, uh, I'm trying to classify resources that we need to classify resources. So for example, we can classify them into renewable and non-renewable. So when we are saying renewable resources, uh, then we are talking about the living resources which can restock or renew naturally or by human activity. For example, a timber forest which grows back. And then non-renewable resources which are not reversible, once we use them, uh, we cannot uh, use them again or they are not available. For example, oil, minerals, either it runs out of stock or it takes a lot of time, uh, hundreds of years uh, for turning hundreds and several hundred years to turn again to regenerate. Then we can also classify resources in terms of biotic resources and abiotic resources. Biotic means uh, we are saying that, that they have life, uh, which include animals and plants, and abiotic, which are not living particularly, for example, the mineral resources, the fossil fuels and all, we can say they are abiotic resources. We can also call classify resources into stock flow resources and fund resource, service resource. In my earlier talk also, I discussed uh, briefly about them, that the stock flow resources are raw materials provided by nature, and they can be physically transferred in economic products. For example, using timber to make house. On the other hand, if we talk about fund resources, they have a specific configuration of stock flow resources and they do not become part of the output like the best stock flow resource. For example, a forest ecosystem which provides the ecosystem services can be an example of fund service resource. Here in this slide also, uh, we, I have put up a table uh, from Keran Suryu. Uh, which is showing a stock and flow and also in terms of non renewable resources, which I have already talked about, what are these? Uh, look at the last uh, part, that is the resources and their characteristics. So we can broadly classify the resources into three 
categories, you can say that we can categorize them based on the utility. How much utility one is getting out of the resource, whether the resource is uh, availability, uh, whether it's uh, available for long, it has limited availability, what are the potential availability we can talk about. Then there's also a third part, uh, which characterizes it as the depletion and consumption. What are the consumption rates and what are the depletion rates? And based on that, the pot we can assess the potential of these uh, resources. For example, the fossil fuels. For example, in India, the coal, it is estimated that after uh, 100 years or so, India will not have enough coal to even power it. Even today, there is struggle, but after 100 years or so, India will 100, some estimates say 200 years, India will run up the coal. India is one of the largest coal resources in the world. Now, uh, talking about renewable resources and the economic theory backing up them. So, the basic premises and key questions uh, with regards to this topic is that uh, renewable resources, as I talked, can, be, can regenerate like the fish, wild animals, they have birth, growth, and their cycle. However, these cycle, the birth, growth, and this, this is a complex process. It involves complex interaction, interdependence, interrelationships between the living and the long living matters, including humans. And it is difficult to estimate. And then another important question then comes, how we can achieve sustainable management of renewable resources when there is uh, so much pressure on the environment? There are a lot of human interventions which are affecting the natural state of environment. So one of the key things to do that is the sustainable management. For sustainable management, of course, we need information on the nature and of the reproduction and growth of the re natural renewable resources. And it is uh, difficult to obtain. Uh, so if you are looking at biological resources, so there are many unknown variables like ecology and biology of resource population, which it's not so easy to estimate. And there are several models which exist for projecting and assessing the growth of ecological and biological resources for harvesting. So we'll discuss uh, two simple models in the coming slides. For example, uh, this uh, equation uh, number one uh, is from Delhi and Farley 2004. Uh, so the equation, if you look at which, uh, which is written as Bt plus delta T equals Bt plus G, which is dependent on Bt and alpha and delta T. So where Bt is the population or biomass of the resource at a point in time t, t plus delta t shows the change in the stock of the biomass over a specific interval of time. G B is uh, t is natural growth of population biomass per unit time. And also the can be biological grade of the resource, maybe age to be in place composition Amak, or Amak, environment. Please speak louder. Yeah. Yes. Please speak louder. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, alpha can be biological traits, uh, which may involve age distribution, sex composition, and environmental factors that affect rate of growth of population. So uh, if you just shift Bt to the left side and subtract from Bt plus delta T, so that's what uh, equation two. Then if you move further, if you shift delta T also to the left side, so the equation, it becomes in the form of equation three, del B on T, of G. So and the notation time is Delta B T on delta T I'm talking about depends primarily on the size of initial population, which we said B, which is D B T. So here, uh, when we are saying this, we assume that uh, net mortality rates have been taken into account. There's uh, another key point here that <clears throat> as stock B of the resource grows over time, <clears throat> can 
think I that size of the stock is also a function of time. But in equation three, we, we are saying that it's not a function in, of time, it's in point, point in time. At a particular time we are talking about. So that is static. So the moment we say that, uh, which is true also that the stock grows over time, so the stock should be a function of time. So the growth function, uh, which we have specified, should change as g is a function of bt and b is a function of t. Then it will become dynamic, else equation 3, which we have represented, is static in nature. So one of the applications of equation 3 is that if you use the annual growth figures, uh, say for uh, endangered species in India like tiger, vulture, so we can chalk out the future goal of action for conserving the, these species. It has implications for policy. Next, uh, we, another bioeconomic model we are discussing, uh, the fishery sectors we are talking about. So uh, the most desirable uh, sustainable harvest should depend on three variables we are saying. So that will be nature of the natural growth function, size of the fish population, the amount of economic resources utilized. Uh, one key term I'm uh, talking here, which is of relevance, is fishing effort. So by fishing effort, it means all the economic factors. We are talking, say, labor, capital involved in it, energy involved in it, or, or the raw materials involved for fish harvesting activities. So equation four represents uh, very simply Question by economic model for fishery sectors, where H is the fish catch or harvest, which is a function. We are saying it's a function of the stock or biomass or fish population, which is represented as B. And the capital letter E is reflecting efforts, which I uh, talked uh, above that fishing effort, which can be in the form of labor, capital, energy, raw materials, all comprise efforts. So if you look at the uh, equation four, we can simply say that uh, higher the effort level, the larger will be the harvest or the catch of the fish. And we can also say that at a given level of effort, larger is the population because it's also a function of stuck that is b so at a given effort level larger is the population size larger will be the catch now uh, what is the problem with uh, equation four uh, that is h is a function of b that is stock or population and e for effort h is the production of the fish or the harvest so here uh, if we have not talked about whether uh, at any condition the harvest is sustainable or not. So one of the solutions that David and Harley say that if we replace the harvest by natural growth rate, then that becomes a steady state bioeconomic equilibrium. So which is represented in question five. So he says that the equilibrium condition will be attained when the condition as follows is met, that is, del bt upon del t we talked uh, in the earlier model and that is equal to gbt that uh, is a function of the initial stock we say but here in case of fisheries uh, we are subtracting ht so we are saying that at any point in time harvest is offset by natural growth so that's how it became a steady state by equilibrium we are subtracting uh, HT, uh, thus allowing the underlying population side to remain constant. So now this is a steady state. We are also subtracting the natural growth rate. And in fisheries economics, uh, sustainable yield actually represents the natural growth expressed in terms of efforts, which we talked earlier. Now, uh, in this slide, uh, if you look at figure one, it shows a sustainable yield curve. So this curve is uh, for any long-term production function of a biological resource. But Hussein uh, 2000 has used is showing it for the fisheries sector. And we can see on the y-axis, there is H, harvest or production. And E is represented on the x-axis. That is the effort I was talking about in the earlier slide. 
So here on the curve, each point along the sustainable yield curve, as I see, which I am saying, an equilibrial population size for a given level of effort. So if we uh, take uh, go up from the x-axis to y, so it will reflect that uh, equilibrium population size for a given level of effort. So another important feature of the curve is it's an inverted shape. That is, there's an inverse relationship between effort and the harvest of the fishes. Say, if I'm talking about fishes, and a resource management application can be that we can control the effort. And the inverse relation says that it is possible that with development of technology and improve, uh, we increase the effort, so harvest will increase. But after a point, when it becomes unsustainable, so even if we increase the effort, harvest will not increase become the fish population in this example would have gone much below the sustainable levels in fact they will be on the verge of extinction so we have destructed the ecosystem and graham in 1935 also gave a theory called graham's theory of sustainable fishing he says that if his stock size is maintained at half a skip carrying capacity the population growth is fastest and sustainable yield is greatest. So uh, in this figure, we have to talk about Graham's theory. So the top, the top of the plateau here, he says that the, this is the level we have to maintain. The stock size should not exceed beyond this level. Now, like any bioeconomic model there are limitations so in this model also there are some limitations so one of the limitations i already discussed in the earlier slide about uh, distinguishing between the dynamic model and static so here uh, we say that the model is static so but we say that the fish population is dependent the stock might depend depends on time so here we need to consider the intertemporal allocation of resource maximum values and benefits that is discounted at short discount rates so uh, we have to take into account this is a static model so that aspect has to be considered the depression aspect Second thing that uh, limits this model is the price and uh, technology and the changes involved in it. For example, uh, we have assumed in the model that the input and output prices are constants and there was no technological change involved. But suppose a situation where uh, if we increase the output price or decrease the input price, or there is a situation where uh, technological improvement or innovation happens in the free sector. So these both factors that uh, increase in the output prices that demand um, the market more and prices of these both. So people will try to harvest more and more fishes. Or the effort which we are applying, the raw materials, the manpower, that is available cheaper. So there is a decrease in price. And there's a technology constant. So machines have come. There is innovation. So all these factors will lead to two things. First, there will be overfishing. And second, there will be negative impact on the equilibrium population. As I was talking about, that the moment the sustainable yield curves from the platform goes down means that we are moving towards degradation, destruction, and extinction of the fish population. Another aspect which uh, limits this bioeconomic model, which we discussed, is the species of the fishes. Uh, when we were discussing that model, uh, I forgot to mention that we were particularly talking about a particular species of fish. But uh, in a real scenario, uh, say the ocean, there are multiple types of fishes and other aquatic animals living in it or a river or a pond so presence of one 
affects the ecological dance of other for example we all know that there are some fishes uh, which are which eat other fishes like the pirahana so they, that eats fish on other uh, fishes which are grown for food and as sold in the market so presence may affect their ecological dynamics. Maybe the fish population migrates uh, or they, they, they eat it at a fast rate, so the population decreases. And another thing can be in the equilibrium, which we have assumed we've said that is stable, steady state equilibrium, which I talked earlier. But we know that in natural systems, uh, there can be always instability. For example, if you're talking about uh, the water uh, where fishes live, so there can be changes in water temperature. New predators like Pirahana I mentioned, a uh, disease might spread. There is uh, pollution like we all uh, heard about the Gulf of Mexico episode where uh, British Petroleum BP, one of the big companies, uh, discharged a lot of amount of oil spilled in the ocean and that led to large destruction. So such uh, environmental factors may, might also affect the model. So, uh, so far uh, we were talking about renewable resources and some of the economic theories and premises uh, governing them. We talked about two simple models, limitations of that bioeconomic model. Here I'm trying to talk about non-renewable resources. So some of the basic premises and key questions governing non-renewable resources. We know that uh, non-renewable resources have a fixed stock uh, like fossil fuels, coal, minerals, and other metals like aluminium, potassium, cobalt, etc. So they all need a time span for uh, regeneration. I was talking about that. For example, the coal takes uh, hundreds and hundreds of years to turn into the, bio the biological mass like wood and trees when they go down under the ground. So after decomposition, take hundreds and years to convert say coal so they need some geological time span to regenerate and the rate of stock creation over time of non-renewable resources is zero the non-renewable resources can be classified into non-recyclable and recyclable for example many of the metals they are recycled back and used in industry and again, for like uh, renewable resources, uh, non-renewable resources, there are several models uh, which assess and project growth of these resources. So here, uh, I've shown a, a simple example, a simple equation where with which we can understand the relationship of the stock of non-renewable resource and the flow of service that these resources provide over time. So, so we have uh, we can see in equations six and seven. So we see that the uh, alphabets uh, depicted as S naught, S T, and R T. So S naught is the fixed stock of re non renewable resource at the time of discovery, say, and S T is the quality of a stock. At a specific resource, uh, a specific resource at a time t, and where time t varies from say zero to up to t, and R t as the rate of extraction or a flow of service at time t. So, in turn, when we are talking about non-renewable resources, if there is no extraction happening and natural process of degradation is there, so we can say that the S t is equal to S naught that uh, quality of stock at a specified time period t will equal the stock initial stock at time of discovery when there is no extraction and we assume that uh, there is no degradation or destruction or havoc caused by human induced factors so it is uh, happening at a natural pace no extraction is there so in that case st equals s naught but the moment we consider extraction, so which uh, 
actually happens that in case of you know, non-renewable resources like uh, fossil fuels and minerals, the, the, they are extracted. So the relationship between stock and service flow of non-renewable resources, if you assume that they are extracted with a positive rate per unit time, which is represented by the RT, so then at any point in time, T, the stock of resource will be equal to the initial stock which was discovered and then we are saying that uh, summation rt which is the rate of extraction over a period of time it has the all extraction rate we sum and we subtract so what is left with the, that point time t this uh, equation uh, seven uh, which we say that at a point the stock will be equal to the initial stock which was discovered minus uh, the old action or that point in it is subject to condition which is represented by equation eight so it says that s naught should be greater than or equal to summation of rt s naught is the initial stock at time of discovery so it should be greater or equal which makes sense because if the extraction rate becomes equal to the initial stock which was discovered so we can say that the that particular resource is going to be exhausted uh, another aspect we talked in the earlier slide that uh, non renewable resources can be classified uh, into recyclable and non recyclable so if you take into uh, account the recycling factor which i have represented as dt so now the net extraction rate uh, effectively becomes RT minus GT. So we can say that some amount is going back. That's why RT minus GT. So uh, we also know that we cannot have a perfect system or a recycling technology. So that gives us equation number nine, which says RT minus GT should be greater than zero. Uh, which is sensible. So uh, here we have to take uh, think about two thing, important things which we can take away is that uh, with regards to recycling and extraction, that even if we consider recycling, the non renewable resources one day will eventually exhaust. So how good we recycle? And we know that we cannot recycle anything 100%. So it means that uh, the recycling actually is giving us some time. So we are just increasing the time of that exhaustion. So which will uh, we'll understand this exhaustion in one of the graphs, uh, one of the figures, uh, which will come later. Now, talking about uh, non renewable resources and uh, limits to economic growth here particularly uh, uh, the basic premise i talked earlier that the, this population is rising the demand is rising for resources consumption is increasing so there is a lot of pressure uh, on resources always on the environment because people are also uh, polluting it so one of the very important concepts uh, when we are talking about limits to economic growth is resource curve so a uh, resource curse uh, is a paradoxical situation uh, which where you can say that a country underperforms economically despite uh, its home to a valuable natural resources. So when I'll talk about the examples below, it will become more clear to you uh, what is a resource curse. So here in resource curse, uh, we say that a country focuses all its production means on a resource dependent sector we are particularly talking about a particular commodity in the economy for example i have mentioned three examples say nauru nauru is a small country in the south pacific ocean so it it, it has been for 100 years uh, it was very rich in phosphates metal phosphates so they started to mine it and uh, if you look at uh, the economy of Nauru and Google it, you'll find that it was a very rich economy, very rich. The per capita income was very high. If you look at some time back, 
But recently, well, over the years, what now happened in Nauru, they unsustainably mined phosphate. And today, the condition of the country is that 80% of the land in the country is barren. So, and this is only because they, they are totally dependent on phosphate. They did not diversify and this mines unsustainably. Another example is Venezuela. Venezuela is one of the largest uh, oil reserves holding countries in the world. Very prosperous countries, if you look a, decade, a few decades back. Now it is almost bankrupt. Hyperinflation is there. And again, the same situation. They are dependent on one resource, oil. And they did not diversify. Same happened with Nigeria in terms of mineral resources. However, the presently, if we talk about uh, out of these three countries, Nigeria is much better off. It's an African country. Uh, they are now diversifying. It's one of the major economies in Africa. And one of the reasons uh, why they did not diversify that we'll see uh, the countries where resource scarce hypothesis is applicable you will find that there exists corruption in the economy there have been coups military rule autocratic rules like venezuela in nauru nigeria also some decades back now uh, this is the last part of uh, the talk where i'm going to talk about capital stock of the economy so economist capital stock uh, say can be categorized into factors so the first uh, we can say it can be durable capital in manufacturing which are durable equipments which are used for production like tools machinery buildings vehicles etc and uh, investment in these uh, durable capitals will be involve labor natural resources then we can say another component can be human capital, which is uh, people's knowledge, skill, health. And this is utilized for productive work. So investment in human capital will involve the skill training, educating them. Another component can be intellectual capital in the economy, which is the knowledge and skill available to the economy. But that is not embodied in particular individual, rather it's in the form of books, cultural artifacts, computer memories, so which are saved. So they may wear out, encoding may wear out, but can be replaced. Here again, uh, the uh, we can say that non-use leads to forgetting, which in this case, uh, context here particularly saying depreciation we will take into account. Uh, then we can say that another component is social capital, which are a set of institutions and custom which organize economic activity in the country. So unlike intellectual capital and durable capital, they don't wear out. But yes, uh, over a period of time, they can become obsolete. And as the situation and prevalent in the economy changes. So it means that we need to also change uh, our institutions and customs if they are not effective over time. And another key component is natural capital, which is part go talk of this lecture. So we can say natural capital as any stock or flow of energy material that produces goods and services and comprises of resources like renewable, non-renewable. It may be provide it may be a sink that observe, neutralize, or recycle waste like the environment, or we can say ecosystem services. It can be a process like climate regulation. So for a econ in an economy, we can model a capital stock in economy uh, very simply by using question, which is again given by Delhi and Fale, 2004. So it's represented in equation 10. So where capital stock is represented by K, alphabet K. So at KT at point T is function of one uh, back time period, KT minus one. And I is a flow into that capital, which is represented as IT. And D is a flow, 
uh, uh, depreciation, we can say, as a flow which diminishes that capital. So we can model it uh, with simple, of course, there are several factors involved, but a uh, basic fundamental equation may look like this. Now, uh, this is my last slide, probably. Yeah. So here I have tried to show some relationship between the natural and human made capital, the ecosystem is stocks and flows. So here we see that the top rectangle that is human made capital and the uh, bottom one is natural capital. And we see the arrows coming in, broad arrows, which are inputs into the system. So we also see that they are uh, taking some inputs and they are producing something like the human made capital. It's uh, producing some benefit flows like ecotourism, Natural capital is providing, say, ecosystem service like garbage sequestration. And we also see some arrows uh, which are coming back, recycling within the systems and from one system to other. For example, human, we say the right side, the green arrow with R. Uh, R stands for reinvestment, or you can say recycling also to some extent. So the human uh, humans are taking the natural ca capital. They are consuming the natural capital. And if you look at the reinvestment, so there is a reinvestment in human capital to take into account the depreciation aspect. And then there is a reinvestment. If you look at the natural capital block at the bottom, so to sustain the output of ecosystem service. For example, how can we sustain the output of the ecosystem service? So say one uses organic matter in the soil. It's enhancing the fertility of the soil. And another aspect uh, which we have to take care of here is that we have to understand the scale and or the value of the intermediates services consumed in production of these final goods while we are talking about the interaction between the human made capital and natural capital so that's all i think uh, for today's counseling session and now we can summarize uh, today's counseling session uh, briefly within a minute or two so we can say that natural resource economics focuses on supply, demand, and allocation of world's natural resources. Natural resources can be best classified based on physical properties. Their time scale of relevance is taken into account the depreciation aspect. It may be classified based on characteristics uh, like utility, their availability, their potential for depletion and consumption. And several economic models exist for assessing and projecting growth of ecological or biological resources and non-renewable resources. Several countries uh, suffer resource scarce in the world, and that is putting up limits to their economic growth. I talked about uh, taking examples of Venezuela, Nauru, and Nigeria. So there is need for a proper organization and reinvestment in the nature and environment, which will enhance and possibly maintain a stock of natural resource capital for the future. Uh, that is what we are aiming for, sustainable development. That's all. These are the references I have used. And these are some readings I have suggested for today's lecture. Thank you. Hello.